Hamilton is now recording and it is the top of the hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to welcome everyone to today's session. I'm sure there are going to be more people joining as, as we start because it is, it is bang on time. And I'd just like to say welcome to everyone. And I'm going to, first of all, introduce you to our guests. Um, we are joined today, not by not one, not two, but three guests. And I'm very, very excited to have the conversation that we're going to have today. First of all, we're joined by Lauren Waldman and Lauren has one true calling. And that really is to increase our abilities to learn and be more optimal humans by getting to know experience and join forces with our brains. Lauren is one of the first learning designers in the world to merge the operational function of the brain with cognitive theories, spearheading the evolution of optimizing learning design. And as I mentioned earlier on, Lauren is joining us at uh, coming up to eight o'clock in Canada. We're also joined by Helen Marshall. Helen is head of learning at Thrive and has worked with an array of clients from startups to global consulting firms. And Helen is passionate about helping people learn and to be better and is an advocate of being yourself in the workplace. And finally, we're joined by David Hastings. David is at the center of human skills, learning science, technology and the modern workplace. David works to design and deliver human speak learning solutions for organizations across the globe from professional associations, uh, the Fortune Global 500 and even to a couple of presidential offices. David is fascinated by the bigger picture, understanding our reality and making the world a better place to live in. Lauren, David and Helen, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Great to have you with us. Um, what I'd like to do first of all is just ask everyone that's in the room um, just to pop into the chat panel as we're talking about uh, humanizing the workplace, etc. And just to give us a feel for how you're doing today and a bit of a temperature gauge, just drop into the chat panel, if you would, just how you're getting on today, how you're feeling, how your day's going. Just drop that into the chat panel, if you would, for us. I'll just give you a moment or two to, uh, <laughs> to do that. Thank you, everyone. And what I'm just going to then do is, Lauren, I'm going to pass over to you, first of all, just for you to, as you're looking at what people are saying in the chat panel there. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about the e uh, evolution of humanizing in the workplace today. Where? looking at what everyone's saying in the chat, where does that actually begin? Well, I appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, honesty. And um, I'm sorry for everybody else who's hungry with me. Busy, busy, busy. Yes, um, I think everybody's very busy, busy, busy right now. It's a great little Friday. It's Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, when we're talking about humanizing the workplace, you know, I think it, it can really be all about just asking that, how are you, how are you doing? And sort of being okay to be honest with that, especially in, in the times in the year that we've had. So I thought, um, you know, a great place for us to, to start and just for all of us to have this conversation is, you know, not only to see how we are, but to see how we have been doing these past 18 months, because a lot has happened to all of us these past 18 months. So I'm gonna ask um, Michael, if you would, Let's let's just kick this off with with the with the first poll question and um, use the chat again to to respond. Take a minute and just uh, if you want to sort of look at these as like an A B C D, you know Z type of response. Take a look at the the poll question and just let let us know. You know maybe you are all of these things, um, but I'll I'll sort of like look at them with you. There's plenty of options. You know, not everybody <laughs> had like an apocalyptic pandemic. Some people really thrived in it, but we'll see as the chat answers come in. I'm just looking at what's coming in on the poll. I think we've had about 50% of the people in the room have completed it. And at the moment, the way it's looking, let's just have a look. It's changing constantly, but at the moment, um, 23% are saying they thrived uh, during the pandemic. 19% um, lost motivation and productivity, and uh, 13% became more hyper productive. I'll just give it one or two more seconds. I can see that a few people are popping things in the chat panel as well. I'll now close the poll. And what I'll do is, Lauren, I will share that so you can see that 
on the screen as well. Now you, everyone should be able to see the results to question one. Wow. Okay. So this is amazing. Um, so this is something that uh, myself and uh, my other business partner, we've, we've asked thousands of people at this point, you know, how are you doing? And some people did 100% thrive in the pandemic world. Um, and, you know, it could be because you felt more comfortable being at home. You felt more productive being at home and working from home. It could be because you didn't have to get dressed anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you grew to had more time to do exercise and eat. Um, but there was such a, a spectrum, and this is collected from you know 12 months of data and research, um, you know, from myself and from our teams. But there was such a spectrum of human emotion and cognition and the, the sort of fluctuations of what we all went through. So thank you all, first of all, for just sharing with you know humble honesty how you're all doing. As we continue to go through this conversation today. Um, we're just going to sort of like talk about this. We're going to talk about how this affected us, what we're doing with our organizations and how we can support other people. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I can say that my, my pandemic, uh, 18 months, especially being here in Toronto was definitely, I was the whole alphabet. You know, on any given day, I could have been the whole alphabet. Uh, Helen, David, what about you guys? How did you respond to this one? <laughs> Yeah, I probably could have ticked, ticked every one of those boxes, to be fair. Um, yeah, it was, um, I, mean, I had a baby during the pandemic. So, you know, I experienced a lot of emotions on top of um, <laughs> the pandemic, you know, affected me as, as an individual um, quite a lot. Um, and like I said, I, I probably felt a whole range of emotions, but then obviously having a child during that time as well, um, was a whole other ball game, I think. How did you feel, David? I wish I would have worked out at least a couple more times and by a couple more times, I mean, at least twice, <laughs> then I would have been, I was the whole darn alphabet. Um, but no, it's, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a great experience all over, but towards the end, thriving, finding some energy and becoming super productive. I think I, I align to most. I see, Helen, you've got some congratulations coming coming in on the chat. I think yeah. uh, if you had a baby during the pandemic, you win. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're the whole alphabet in multiple different languages, probably. So. Yeah, it was um, it, it's it's interesting, I think, because um, yeah, it's it's I mean, it's it's hard enough, I think, having having a child in general, obviously, anyway. But then when you're not allowed to go anywhere or do anything. Um, yeah, that's just a different a different level. But then at the same time, I think personally, there were certain areas that, that I thrived in. So do also resonate with the people who are saying that I thrived in this world. I quite like that being that having the time to yourself in, in some respects as well, which, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be quite interesting to dig into that a little bit more about the, the, you know, what it was that made people thrive as well as the things that people struggled with. Well, in, when you look at it from a scientific perspective, so myself in the first few, the first few months of the pandemic, I was on fire. I was like, I was like every online yoga class, every workout class, I'm going to work in between. <laughs> I'm going to run around that neighborhood. And then, you know, six months, I was like, I, I don't know if I can maintain this pace or if I'm, if I'm this happy anymore, watching what's really going down and the brain loving to be able to predict what's coming next when we were unable to predict what was coming next it was, it was like, oh, okay, maybe this isn't as like thriving as I thought it was going to be. And this isn't sort of the, the staycation that we thought it could be. It's now, this is now a serious global, global situation. David, um, in the chat, too much Zoom teams, any other online meetings. Yeah. When that terminology of Zoom fatigue came out, um, I mean, first it was a trending, it was a trending terminology, but when we look at the science of it, you know, of course we were going to have Zoom fatigue. Our brains are energy like and suck. I've just lost Lauren there. I don't know if anyone else can still hear her. Yeah, I think I've just Laura, lost Lauren as well. Yes, John is just saying the same. Uh, <laughs> it's I typical, think... isn't it? We, we lose someone when we're talking about technology and Zoom, etc. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way. I'll give you a second or two. I wonder if Lauren can, she probably can't hear us. Can you hear us there, Lauren? No, I think Lauren's frozen completely. So hopefully Lauren will jump off and jump back in again i can see there's some bit, bits ah lauren is just saying in the chat uh, to everyone i think she's just going to log off yeah she's just logged off so i'm just going to keep an, an eye as she comes back in is there anything david or helen that you wanted to just mention whilst 
Lauren is just rejoining us. Well, I think that this Lauren might have ended up um, heading in this direction with her point, maybe, yeah. um, but maybe we'll see what happens when she when she comes back on. But um, one thing that I was going to mention was about this idea of uncertainty. Um, and there's an article I think, Michael, you can share um, in the comments um, called um, We're Not Machines, um, which hones in on this idea of, of being human and being honest at work um, and kind of not necessarily hiding behind the fact that you're, 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 you, you might say that you're okay, but actually you're, you're not. Um, Lauren, I can see Lauren is back now. Um, Did it really just like drop me as I was saying Zoom fail? <laughs> <laughs> it, perfect timing wasn't it was it i couldn't do i you just can't plan these things <laughs> sorry what um, were you I was, on? yeah i was just i just mentioned i was just mentioning an, an article um called we're not machines that and that michael you've put in the chat um which was about the fact that um you might I, I don't know whether anyone else has felt like this but it's sometimes quite difficult to establish a relationship effectively in an online environment and I think knowing that you can talk um, honestly with people is, is quite you know a big factor um, in, this, in establishing those relationships and I think a lot of the time you don't really make the space to um, to say to kind of dig into whether you are actually okay or not and you kind of just answer people saying yeah I'm fine let's get on with talking about work instead of actually making a space um, and I suppose you have to place yourself in quite a vulnerable position in, in, in that situation. Um, and maybe that vulnerability uh, needs to be seen in, in all aspects of an organization. So, and particularly perhaps in senior leadership, knowing that it's okay to admit that you're maybe feeling a bit frazzled and that it's not all roses for everybody. Um, and I think that, that article kind of digs into, into that in, in, in a little bit of detail. So I find it quite interesting and it, it was, maybe loosely related to what you were about to say, Lauren. Well, I think, you know, what you're saying as well, Helen, and probably to everyone else is that we want, we want to have environments where we do feel, you know, that we can express ourselves and we can, we can be vulnerable in that. But there's multiple generations who grew up not having that behavioral pattern represented to them and not being demonstrated to them. So expressing that, or even a cultural, you know, from, from a cultural perspective as well, we've got global, you know, global cultures where you know expression of, of feelings and emotions aren't you know <laughs> aren't very much accepted within the culture so then to take that into another setting and especially into the organizational setting it can be very challenging so even to we know that you know it wasn't through through data and research but forget data and research just from talking to people like we're doing today is you know people just weren't feeling comfortable at this point to go up to their boss and be like I'm on my kitchen floor crying. Can I take the rest of the day? <laughs> it's just didn't it didn't happen, and that's why this is like really important to be speaking about. And I can see David, you're saying like onboarding. Uh, yeah, we I heard a lot of that onboarding new team members was really difficult, and I think we're still going to see that happening. Um, Craig, uh, starting like imposter syndrome added to the way I was feeling. Yeah, right. Like when you are starting somewhere new, when you are trying to manage um, a cognitive load, your emotional load, you're trying to navigate what's going on in a whole world because the world is changing around you. And I'm sure some of you work for organizations that you're not just working within your own country, you're trying to navigate the other countries as well and trying to be sensitive and be aware, which is very challenging at times to sort of keep your eye on the prize and see, I'm here in, in Toronto, Canada, Helen's in the UK, you know, did we have the same pandemic experience in our cities? No, we didn't. <laughs> you know, um, I know Will's on the line here. He's over in New York. Uh, New York opened a little bit sooner than Toronto did. So for me speaking to friends over in the US and they're like, we're out for dinner and we're at the coffee shop. I'm like, I'm in lockdown. <laughs> so I kind of don't like you right now, but I still love you. <laughs> and so that was part of our experience as well. So Lauren, I've just been sent a message by Julie in, uh, she sent it to me privately. So if, if, if people are sending messages, if I can just remind you to send them to everyone, she's just saying, how do we build that confidence to share with uh, the sort of the leadership team, how we're actually feeling? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. It's like, it, I think Julie, you're asking the right questions. How do we as the individuals, right? So it, it starts with us. It starts with, you know, our own behaviors and leaders, you know, leaders are in essence, they're just humans as well. I can tell you that what became very clear from 
uh, the, the people that we spoke to was we recognized that, you know, a senior vice president or someone who is in a very high leadership position had a very different pandemic experience, you know, um, not only from their personal experience, but then, you know, when things started to sort of look like they, we were coming out of it, it was, you know, their behaviors because of what they do in their everyday was we got to get back to policies and procedures and get things going and operations going and let's rip the bandaid and hybrid, you know, teams. So I think, you know, if, the leaders themselves, again, humans, can sort of have a create a bigger awareness of the experiences that other people had and really talk to people about that, which is again why we're talking to, to everyone like this today, is then we can start breaking down some of the, the vulnerability barriers and be more empathetic to the situations that other people had. And I think that's the way that we really, you know, can can go into it. The other part of that too, Julie is a lot of us aren't necessarily on a day-to-day -day basis aware, like really focusedly aware in the present moment of how we're doing and how, you know, we don't check in with ourselves and monitor ourselves enough to be able to self-regulate, to be like, this is how I'm feeling and how to express it then in a way that people can hear us without it coming out in a way that we don't want them to hear us. So I think it's a combination of just really looking at the landscape of the different and, and having that cognitive awareness of like, People went through so many different things, but then looking inwards and going, how am I doing? And can I sort of take a moment to focus and be present in myself to then be humble and honest with the way that I'm feeling and be able to articulate in a way that other people can feel safe doing the same? Yeah, I think I think also picking up on, on that kind of self-reflection and self-awareness is it's like like you said, Lauren, it's really hard to be in a moment and start to recognize that maybe. You need to take a step back you're you're maybe about to experience burnout potentially but it's very hard to do things like that within a moment um and it, sometimes it takes coming out of the other side to look back and think well there are actually a lot of signs there that i could have maybe paid attention to that that perhaps i hadn't done um and i would say that a, approaching anyone and putting yourself in a vulnerable situation is always very tricky um, so I think that's, that's why within an organization, it, it, it almost has to be um, leadership driven to, to, to say that it's OK. Like, I'm feeling like this as well. Um, I'm I am a human um, rather than put, putting the onus on certain individuals to, to come to senior leadership and, in, say, and giving messages like that themselves. Um, not that the, all the ownership should be on them, but I think that, you know, having that message is, is really important. Yeah, I've definitely been inspired in our organization and by family and friends who've opened up to say, they'll call and say, how are you? And they take the time to listen. And when you finish, they still pause and they still listen. And you're put in a spot where you're like, oh, there's something more here. And you articulate it and you hear yourself articulating these words and it resonates with you deeply. And what I found is that when you do show that vulnerability and you open up, whether it be at work, late night calls, early morning calls and just say, this is taking its toll. <laughs> How's everyone else feeling? You do tend to get a lot of positive, um, a lot of feedback. And you tend to learn a lot from other people as well. When you hear them articulate things, you're like, oh yeah, oh, that's brain fog. Like brain fog is a relatively new concept to me. I only learned this in the last couple of months, I guess, which is crazy considering the amount of research we've been doing on this, <laughs> on this topic. But you articulate it and someone goes, I think that's called that. And then you've got a name to it. And then you're like, oh, maybe I can do something about this. And then the word spreads. And I think when you are at these meetings and you're holding team meetings or meeting with colleagues and you're able to talk about these topics and what you've done and what your experience is with it, um, the conversation flows, which is exactly why we're having this type of conversation now. And you bring up like a really good, you know, I think what people don't realize over they, you know, because, okay, so first of all, um, I don't know if anyone who's on who's on today, and you can just throw it in the chat if if you got this when you were born. But was anyone given an operational manual of their brains when they were born? Did we know how? Like, because I I wasn't. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. <laughs> no, not a clue, right? So we were all sort of you know level playing fields here. So um, I see that I I want to address one of the questions that's come up, and we can probably go to the next poll. But I want to um. John, I see your question there. We're, we're going to get there. Um, is that there is such a subtlety because we aren't, you know, even from, from school age, we're not, uh, I got a deconstructed, I think you're funny, David. Um, 
because we weren't ever educated on these things is, you know, it takes a lot of cognitive energy to harness our present moment awareness. It's a skill that's called metacognition. It's a theory called metacognition is the ability to think about what you're thinking about, but that translates also into our minds and our bodies is, can I stop and say, okay, what's going on? Is my heart rate starting to increase? Is, are my palms becoming sweaty? Am I getting anxious? Like what's going on here? Typically, because the emotional processing center of your brain literally works four times faster than your executive function. So let's just talk, let's talk about that for a second. The emotional processing center of your brain works four times faster. So in order to sort of have those moments of like being able to not express, not only express to people how you're doing, but then not trauma dump, which we've been, you know, because not, not all of us are trained to be able to deal with that. Right? How do we deal with that when someone just all of a sudden is like the floodgates open? Um, and I think John, I want to go back to um, to your question, and maybe Michael, it's a good time for us to bring up that that second that second poll question. Michael, if you're there, oh, there we go. <laughs> Hopefully, everyone should be able to see that now. So feel free to pop into the poll there there's just the three three options is there anything else that you want to share then feel free to drop it into the the chat as well the way it's looking at the moment very very close actually no, slightly changed i'll give it one or two more seconds and i can see that we're now in about 70 percent of the room have responded so i'm going to i'm going to share the results with you lauren if i may Please. I'll just close the poll now. Thank you for everyone that's taken part. And I will just share those results. Hopefully, Lauren, you can see those up on your screen. I can. Is, is that what you were expecting? I never know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> this could change, you know, you know, motivation changes on a minute to minute basis. So um I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, like, you know, I think we're doing well, we could use a little help and yeah, that's me. It's overwhelming. Yeah. Everything's changing so quickly. Of course, it's going to be overwhelming. Who knows what to predict on a day to day. Um, for those who, who respond, I'm really curious for those who are like, you guys are doing well. I think it's really important for us to talk about what do you think that you're doing well? And where do you think that you could use that help? Right? Like I said, most organizations don't have the luxury of having like therapists or psychologists, neuroscientists um, in, in the building. So, you know, what do you think that's doing well, but where do you think you could use the help? And we'll just keep an eye on the chat for that. Um, Catherine, I just saw your, your, your chat message. Um, we wish we knew how to back up what we wanted to keep in our brains and ditch what we don't want to remember. That happens as you get older. <laughs> so. Wait, just wait till you hit about 75, 80, that'll start happening naturally to you. <laughs> no, I think Faye made a really in, important comment there about um, the desire to withdraw and not kind of um, be here any more stuff because you're dealing, people were dealing with so much individually that it was very difficult then I imagine to then deal with other people's things as well. Um, and I think that kind of, that, that, that resonates. Yeah, um, I want to, See that 100%. Um, that's Faye. I see that comment now. Not Faye. Yes. Um, part of the part of my own sort of d d sort of downward spiral, if you will, into my own burnout was the fact that you know we're in the job of helping people and listening to people, but listening to things that are pretty hard on a day to day basis, which is why our doctors and psychologists are having a hard time right now as well. Um, you know, it, it's challenging and you want it as a good human, you want to be able to speak to people and help people. But when, when it's constant and not just from the people that are in your, you know, social circle and environments and your work circles, but then you're listening to the global narrative as well. It can be very heavy. It can feel very heavy. So thank you. I appreciate that. Well, solutionless listening can be a good framework. I'm just going to sort of keep up with the chat here, see what's going on. There's some, some great tips and ideas coming in on the chat, aren't there? And as you say, it's difficult to, uh, to to keep up with them, isn't it? There's so much interesting stuff coming in there. Oh, I like the um, who's saying this, Desiree. The the well the well being buddies. That's that's amazing. We know right now that you know being having somebody to co regulate with, um, your community to co regulate with is incredibly important right now so that we don't feel so alone, regardless if it's in our social or personal or, or professional environment. So yeah, that's really great. Catherine, you're saying you've got lots of great 
resources um, to the signpost people, professionals that are not, sorry, my chat's like scrolling too fast for me to see. The the, one of the problems, Lauren, that you mentioned about organizations that may not necessarily have the capacity to have counselors or people within those type of positions, I think there's probably a real benefit in some of these things that people are talking about in terms of like well-being buddies or um, mental health allies or people being um, for mental, for, uh, was, what's the term, mental health first aid trained. Um, I think that that's like that's it's almost providing that extra element of support that that you know was obviously missing before and people are, are, are feeling like that there was something missing and this is you know what we're setting up in order to kind of combat that as individuals within the organization themselves like the ally program I think sounds great the fact that you're it'll be you helping your colleagues I think is really important yeah, I think the idea of as we're able to be more vulnerable in the workplace and open up around issues that are affecting us, and some of them might be well-being, some of them might be family, familial, um, and a lot of people have been having babies, there are a lot of people changing in to housing circumstances, jobs, all sorts of things, tra family tragedies, being able to come to work and having explain that to your boss and your boss be able to respond to that in the correct way. Um, so we're looking at first responder courses and learning that we can give out to people to try and help people manage those conversations as they come up oh I like yeah. oh sorry go ahead we, we've noticed a, a slight shift um in the content that's being asked of, of us to create in terms of there was a very much a focus on well-being and, and resources to help individuals um from a well-being perspective but now there seems to be a slight um, change in direction towards mental health content specifically um, and I think that's probably off the back of just the huge levels of uncertainty that so many people are still continuing to face and I guess that it doesn't help the, with the fact that um, in the UK specifically there's, there's often talk of the pandemic being over and we're like what's happening and then we're kind of going back into well actually it's not over what's going to happen um, and there's just so much change on a on a on a day to day basis. Um, and again, I just linked to uh, Michael. If you want to share, people on this um, um, webinar might listen to Brené Brown's Dare to Lead podcast. But one of the particular episodes that kind of rings true with a lot of stuff we're talking about here today was an episode with Amy Cuddy, um, where they, they they talked briefly about the idea of misforecasting in terms of how you're going to, you think you should feel about something that's about to happen. So in this particular instance, it was talking about Freedom Day in America being the 4th of July in 2020, when people thought everything was gonna change and there was gonna be this amazing like atmosphere and party atmosphere that everyone was released and the pandemic was over. And actually, obviously that wasn't the case. Um, and I think potentially we've been doing a lot of that in the workplace. Um, so for those of us who have face-to-face -face meetings or have gone back to offices, um, it, it's been great, but there's also been an element of indecision and cognitive overload and exhaustion that comes with that, that maybe hasn't been spoken about as much as it needs to be. And I think great if you're feeling absolutely amazing after doing things like that, but I do think there needs to be an awareness for that um, overload as well. Yeah, so I, I think Nicola in the chat is speaking to yeah. that as well. Yeah, I was just take that one see, but yeah, we've got lots of we've got lots going on in the chat, and I want to acknowledge. Um, so first of all, we've got um, Catherine was saying that there's you know loads of re resources and in, in terms of internal mechanisms and time to listen is a time. Yes, 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 yes. Time to listen is a major factor. Um, you know, it says we're we, we're working on mental health programs, um, and it's I'm I'm very happy to see that you know that your organization is not trying to do this all internally. It's one of the things that sort of is a, it's a little bit of a cheer figure for me guys, to be honest, is, um, you know, does this fall on the lines of human resources and L and D? No, <laughs> they can help to facilitate and they can help to, you know, bring in. But um, I know Irina is also saying we can support from the employer's uh, stations in terms of office furniture. Yes, um, it's been really amazing to bring an awareness that for those people who are now going back into the workplace to bring an awareness to leadership teams from the perspectives of because we all went through a different phase of isolation at one point when we're going back into the environments and you know I can I can just ask this as sort of a side question to everybody in the chat 
is when we go into a social situation again, after we haven't been processing it, so we, we, we call it cute sort of people hangovers, is that first time that you sort of see people and speak to people and all the noises are happening around you, your brain is processing so much more now, um, not to mention the flood of, you know, neurochemicals that are being thrown out at you, like oxytocin, serotonin. It's really exhausting to be around people again um, because you just haven't. So you're not, your energy levels are, are probably like going down a bit more. So I see that we've got um, John, we also need to work out how to deal boundaries. Thank you. This is a very, very important um, discussion is that you're, and you're absolutely right, John, is we all have different levels of safety right now. And we can't make assumptions that our level of safety. So if I, you know, if we are all meeting in person right now, you know, would I feel comfortable with one of you coming up and, you know, shaking my hand or just even handing me a pen? We're seeing, these are called micro, um, micro rejections and we're seeing these happen, but we don't know exactly, people don't know exactly what they are. So it's that what, what used to be a very natural sort of interaction with somebody is now causing a little bit of offense and sort of then, um, not even just an offense, but you kind of feel bad. It's like, oh gosh, all I did, all I wanted to do is like hand you this pen, but you didn't want to touch something that I touch. So <laughs> it's, it's now, it's now, you know, all of that coming up. Um, but yeah, the boundaries and the comfort zones, you're absolutely right. Those definitely need to, the cultivation of the safe, the safe space to be able to talk about those and what you are comfortable with without feeling like you're going to be questioned or shamed for the decisions that you're making for yourself um is is really important so i really appreciate you bringing boundaries into this conversation um and there was one more thing i wanted to the digital fatigue uh nicola yes okay so i've said this publicly i'm gonna say it here psychological safety is nothing that you can buy off the shelf um <laughs> it's it's you can you can get the resources we can get amazing tools but it's the then to your point nicola is how do you deal with the digital fatigue how do you deal with the fact that you've got to produce and do your work, but you also kind of want to learn about yourself as a human so that you can produce and do the work and connect with, with other people at the same time. So there has to be a very fine balance between what resources are being given to people, but it's not only the what, it's, well, then how, how are you implementing those? And how are you finding space for you to focus and learn without exhausting yourself any further. And this is gonna be a challenge across the learning industry is you know we still need to learn, we still need to do some upskilling, but how do you balance that when people's cognitive loads are a little bit lower than they were before? So I appreciate Nicole, you bringing up the, the concept there of the, the digital fatigue, because it's very, very true. I think uh, thinking about those kind of in-between moments as well would probably be quite useful there. So having, having digital um, content or uh, things that are online, but then figuring out what's happening in moments offline um, and, and activities or things that can be done in those in-between moments is quite important. Phil, I want to acknowledge what you, you made an incredibly, I'm just sort of scrolling back up into the chat. Um, you are incredibly correct with what you're saying. Um, so Phil, if you haven't seen what he put in the chat, everyone, it's, um, it's there's a danger in trying to give the wrong people, the skills to deal with some of these issues. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's what I was saying. You know, I think there was a heavy, a heavy weight of responsibility that went to the leadership and to human resources and to L and D to say, okay, you have to implement psychological safety and, you know, get that mental health training. Um, well, did anyone ask if they were well equipped to be able to do that? So there is a danger in doing that. There's also a danger in, in giving people the what through these resources, but not the how. So there's got to be methodology and there's got to be strategy because it's not enough just to be like, yes, go ahead and meditate, <laughs> go meditate for 15 minutes or like, oh, we're going to do yoga for an hour. But without saying to people, okay, there's mechanisms, literal mechanisms in your brain that need to help you to be able to do these things in order to be able to even just bring yourself to a moment of breath and calm, you know, because like I said, this thing is running the show. Your brains are running the show. And depending on which part of it is taking over, it can be very challenging to get into a spot. So you're, you're absolutely right, is we have to be very cautious as to who is learning and then who is passing on that learning as well. Um, exactly. We're not trained. We're not trained as counselors, Desiree. But you're right. It's about the signposting, listening. I think that's the one thing is how do we listen um, empathetically and, you know, 
know how to, I think one of the hardest things sometimes about listening as well, is that if you're an empathetic human is your reactions to the other person. So it's all of a sudden you've got this emotional sort of energy exchange going on and you know you never know as well what are people's memories what were their experiences like am i going to trigger you in some way that's going to set you off and that when i say set you off that could be you might just think that's hysterical and start laughing and be happy where another person is going to break down and start crying another person might get incredibly triggered and angry right away so so yeah it is important for people to understand the impact um, and the resources, but it's so critical at this point to, to my personal, you know, this is again, my, my professional bias is we can't just say, here's a bunch of things and say, good luck. It's, you've really got to drill down into the, how do we do these things? And then giving people the space and the time to learn them. Um, learning means changing your brain. That's, you know, that's the beauty of our brains is they're agile, they're plat, they're, they've got the plasticity, things can move around in there, but they don't happen right away. They don't happen in a 45 minute hour with us having this conversation. We need to give the space and time for these things to, to happen. Helen or David, is there anything in the chat that you see coming up? I'm just going to catch up. Uh, you are, John. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I got a private yar. Yes. <laughs> I was just responding to a um a point that Nicola made about whether we're expecting too much from or the fact that we are expecting too much from people managers who maybe a lot of the time have been promoted into roles instead of necessarily um having those leadership skills that are right for those positions um, and that they're technical experts. So I think that's a, a really um valid point. Um and I, I guess that comes back to the fact that man, not all managers are leaders. Um, whether all managers could become leaders, I don't know, but it, there's probably a gap there for um, some sort of focus on leadership skills in general and leadership training. Yeah, and I see that the, um, you know, the, the heavy, I can tell you with certainty that the data that we collected over the course of the 12 months was um, when it came to the the return to work plans. I, I, no one stopped working. That's a ridiculous phrase. Um, but like, I guess the return to office plans, when I started looking at those and auditing those there, there, it looked, you know, all roads led to the managers. And when we look across the, not necessarily here in Canada, um, definitely over in the U S when we look at the attrition numbers and, you know, what's happening as far as resignations, it's, there's a heavy, heavy amount of people living at the managerial level because all roads led to them. It was, um, get your back to work plan ready and send it to your manager to review, uh, do this training and let your manager know that that's been done. Your manager, your manager, your manager. <laughs> and Helen, to your point from the leadership perspective, if they're not watching what's happening, or if they're the ones delegating everything to one siloed position, then the managers are not, you know, stress leads to burnout and burnout leads to, to, I, I quit. That's, that's basically what we're seeing right now. <sighs> So if the organizations are taking responsibility to create a framework by which people can take some time to listen, because you can, you can implement time for these things. You can say there's a 10 minute gap on every hour meeting where you've got 10 minutes to yourself. There's a five minute gap on every 30 minute meeting. So only book it for 25, take five minutes bio break. Mental health buddies, so whatever, how all, the, all these wonderful ideas we've got. Lauren, you've been on the ground doing research now for, I think, 11 months. And the question that we're asking is what can, what human skills would make the most difference or what human skills should we be learning that can help our workplace and help ourselves and help others in the workplace? So with your experience, what, are, what would be the quick wins? And there are no quick wins in this long, <laughs> in this long battle, but where would you start? Um. My 100% biased opinion based on, you know, personal experience, professional experience is, you know, it's always a good idea to, like I said, I asked, you know, none of us came with the operational manuals of our brains, but there's a lot that we can learn from the right people when it's translated for, you know, right. So I think, you know, understanding the operational system is, is really important. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a really good place to, to start. And I'm not talking to the level of like, you know, incredibly scientific it's, it's these fundamental basics of our, our brains and our operational systems. You know, I feel, 
it's the difference between trying to put together an IKEA piece of furniture um, with with or without the, <laughs> the instructions. <laughs> so it can well, be a that's lot easier. <laughs> well, I know, I know. Maybe that was like a horrible example because even with the instructions with IKEA, you know, it doesn't usually fail. <laughs> but you know, just learning a little bit about that, um, about the operational system itself, and then how to work with it. I use the terminology joining forces. You know, we can't control our brains, but we can join forces with them. And so when we learn those skills um, and regulating our brain states, that's like really, really important. Um, yeah, Will, know yourself well enough to know when your amygdala has been hijacked. So your amygdala is the emotional processing center in your brain. And um, they're so small. I, I used to refer to the amygdala, um, if anyone's ever seen the movie Aladdin, when the genie pops out and he's like, phenomenal cosmic power. And then he goes, like, itty bitty living space. And to me, like that's the amygdala. It's like so, so, so tiny, but it has so many connections to the executive function of your brain. So that's why I was saying it can move so fast. So even in knowing that, right, like that's a really great tip. I hope that everyone can take away that's that conscious awareness is if you know that your emotional response is going to happen four times faster than your executive, you're already one step ahead of being able to regulate when you feel that sort of emotional tension. So I'd say to, to your question, David, it's can we very slowly because you don't learn to do these things overnight. But can we slowly start to learn things like metacognitive awareness is can we start to monitor how to learn how to monitor ourselves, not on like a minute to minute, but like, you know, you eventually can get there, but can we learn how to monitor ourselves so that we can learn the skills to self regulate in those moments that we're feeling like, oh, no, something's about to happen because we all know what our sensations are, we are just usually not present enough in our moments to to recognize that those are coming on and then they're there and we have to deal with them so. It's can we learn a little bit about our operational systems, so that we can learn how to work with it versus just kind of letting everything happen and pass by in the in the very fast and fast world that we we go with. And Helen you've had a quite a different experience um, this last 18 months or so what would your response be what are you bringing into thrive and your team and yourself i think it's uh, the kind of awareness of the individual um, and the fact that everyone on the team is going to have a different experience and a different um, need in a certain situation and just being responsive to that um, in a very human way so um you know giving people the time that they need and the space that they need and but also making sure that um as a, as a line manager i am making myself available for people to talk to me in the, in that kind of open and, and vulnerable way um and then obviously supplying um additional materials for people to reference and and resources that people might use and you know outside of those conversations as well how about you, David? Um, I've made a few mistakes, but they were transparent mistakes with the team. And it was to say, hey, we would uh, we would like to create some sort of weekly check in where we talk KPIs and targets and what's critical and stuff. But I'd like some space in there for social. And to the nth degree, we every time values are concrete, it's baked in everything we do, it's all there. And we were sitting on the call. It was the first one to launch our values meeting, regular check in. We're respectful of everyone's time, right? It's like, yeah. And then halfway through the meeting, we're going, I sat there and I was like, this is just a waste of some people's time. It's not worth them being on at 4 a.m. It's not worth them being on at 10 p.m. So even with the best intention um, we've made, you know, it, it doesn't go right the first time and we improve. So I think my lesson has just been, and the temptation for a long time was to be to bottle it all up and think, right, how can I own creating a weekly team check-in that's going to mean a lot to my team? You just spend like a lot of time researching and thinking about it. Actually, that was all a waste of time because I made too many assumptions. It was easier just to share with the team to go, hey, this is really bothering me. And it's causing me to, it's causing me a bit of discomfort being on calls with team members, knowing that that's probably a really inhospitable time to them. And it's not that important. Um, so sharing, firstly, taking lead to say, hey, I'm not attending this meeting because I'm a bit to be honest, tired. <laughs> and my boss would say, oh, I'd like to spend some time with my kids or I've got to do this, you know, just family time. So I think seeing that it was okay to step out of these things, just to say, I just need five minutes to spend some time with my kids is one thing um, and making those mistakes together. 
There's some good questions that have come up in um, in the chat. So, uh, Phil, I want to acknowledge your your question right now, which is, you know, with every with, with there's so many things that are done to support and training. It's like, how do you know what to bring in that will have the right impact and how you're successful or not? Knowing what to bring in is is that's it's a challenging one because, like as we've been discussing, there's been so many different variables to people's experiences. I think that you know opening the doors to having those honest conversations to ask what people need and, and then, you know, try to cater to the best you can, because the fact of the matter is, is that people are having a hard time even articulating that right now is they, you know, in, in ways that they're like, I'm not quite sure that I even know what I need. So maybe just give me some options. <laughs> and so I think that's the best way is you give some options and you give people the, the opportunity, not for organizations to say, we've bought this, this is what we're doing. Um, but the option for the person behind the screen to go, okay, this is a range of things that I could potentially do that will help me and let me choose what's best for me um, and then have guidance around that. So that's sort of the first. And how, how are you going to know if you're successful or not? You know, it's really going to be on the fact that we're going to be able to see shifts in behaviors. Um, you know, most, if you've worked with your colleagues for a, for a while, you're going to, you'll be able to see those shift in behaviors. Um, people who are new are struggling because they're trying to figure out how, like we were saying with the onboarding, how do we fit into the mix? How do we bond and form, you know, cultural, cultural patterns with people who we've only met through the screen. So, you know, we're, we're going to want to see like, how are those people integrating as well? And the success is really going to be on, on that. It's going to be indicative of the work that you're doing and the behaviors. And hopefully you're not in a place where you are watching people um, walk out the door. And, you know, unfortunately that is one of the measures these days is are people leaving? Um, so that's, that's going to be a big, big measure of success right now, as far as like, are people leaving? Um, you know, are they attending the meetings and showing up? Uh, you know, are, it really is going to depend on, on your company's cultures and, and what's sort of going on in your, in your areas and your geography. So that's kind of the best answer I can give to you for that. Um, John, you asked if we can increase our empathy and emotional intelligence by understanding our brains better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, I can say, and I'll, I'll just, you know, it, it's no secret in the world that, you know, I'm not, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a translator to the scientists themselves. I have my credentials, but I didn't know anything about my own brain. You know, seven years ago, when I started this, I didn't know anything about my own brain. Um, and professionally it changed everything that I did as a designer of learning, but personally, um, if you, there's a go one podcast that I did with Nick Ramsey and that we were talking about that it's fundamentally as a human understanding my operational system changed me so profoundly I I just you look at people very differently and you're much more empathetic and sympathetic to the fact that sometimes there's going to be things that are going on in there that we don't have you just don't have control over and and those emotional tornadoes that can come up or that like cognitive dissonance or you know the being elated it makes so much more sense you know when you understand the why and how it's happening in there. Even something as simple, and it's not simple at all, but memory, you know, how do we have, how do we hold on to our memories? How do we create memories? Why are they, you know, it, it's these fundamental things that none, again, none of us were ever taught make profound differences in the way that we operate and, and sort of interact with one another as humans. So yeah, absolutely. It makes a difference. I'm conscious that uh, we've, 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 we've come to time, but there's one thing I just want to ask everyone. You've, you've talked about Lauren there, the shifts in behaviors, struggling, etc. How do we as, as, as L&D professionals avoid becoming the sort of in inverted commas latest trend? I think that's something that everyone would like to understand. How do we prevent this? How? And it, it's a great question because I think, you know, the world loves a great trend. Um, we also love great catchphrases. You know, at one point I kind of got a little bit triggered by the, the terminology psychological safety because I felt like it was starting to be bastardized. We started to, you know, it was using, it was a marketing gimmick as opposed to, no, this is a real thing. <laughs> this is a real thing that us humans need. Um, I think that, you know, from the, from the L&D perspective and if, you know, I think it's, it's the responsibility of people within the organizations and I think someone put it in the chat there to say no. <laughs> say, so this is not, I'm not comfortable doing this and this is not in my wheelhouse. And I don't think I should be making these decisions um, and take that heavy weight of responsibility off of them and have that open narrative. So I think that's that's probably one of the best, best 
pieces of advice that I would give is just be comfortable saying no and knowing your limitations and, and what you can and cannot do within your professional capacities. That That's a big one for me. David or Helen, do you have anything for that one? Yeah, I'm quite happy. Oh, go on, Helen, off you. Um, well, so I, I feel like there's a difference here in that um, humanizing the workplace and being a human leader, being empathetic, they're things that people generally who I'm speaking to on a day-to-day -day basis are saying that they need in their workplaces, um, which I think is quite different to how other trends in the L&D industry normally come about. Um, so I think that the fact that there's a, there's a general consensus that something needs to shift, something needs to happen, and then we can, you know, as L&D professionals, look at ways to, to make that happen and to support that happening, um, I think is, it's reassuring me that we're investing time in the right place and it's going to be something that, that happens over the longer term. Um, maybe I'm you know, being optimistic there, I don't know, but that, that's, how, that's generally how I'm feeling. Yeah, I share sentiment with uh, Helen. I think the good news is, is that organisations can't escape this. So it's not a trend in the sense of oh, it's a buzzword, it's something we should do, it's going to affect our brand. Yeah, it is. But if you look at, if you look at how are you going to attract a diverse range of employees to work in your organisation in a modern workplace? Well, you've got to cater for all the different ethnicities and working styles and family life. And you've got to you've got to adjust. We've got to adjust to all of this stuff if you want the right people in your organization. And then all of the evidence shows that if you don't have great employee satisfaction, you don't have great customer satisfaction and your product development stalls and your revenues are hit. So all of the metrics point to we need to create these inclusive and safe environments where people can work and be productive and feel emotionally safe. So I've got quite a lot of confidence that this problem isn't going away anytime soon. Um, and the, the sooner we start thinking about and eliminating, not eliminating, recognizing that pandemic may have accelerated and brought on these things like great, great, uh, great resignation and whatever else, but this is really a, pr a problem of this is a modern workplace and the uh, result, the impact of the pandemic on mental health globally is just where they haven't seen the beginning of it yet. So we might as well start preparing for it. Um, but yeah, it's not going anywhere. We'll be talking about this for a while and learning some lessons and improving on what we do and making the toolkits better, making the signposting better, creating pathways that people can align to or be inspired by. Because as we've said, there's so many different issues. It's not easy to lay out a menu and go, hey, which one of these are you, uh, are you on? You need to be able to hear things. You need to create these, these moments where people can share and be vulnerable so that you do realize and become aware of what else is out there and then find the right tools and find the right help. Thank yeah, you. It's going to be a matter of not making it overwhelming, right? Is, you know, yeah. you know, all, I think all of us, you know, myself, Helen, David, like we're, we're all solution providers as well. We're trying to learn we're trying to learn how to best serve and how to best help organizations and humans in the ways that we can without like everything that we talked about today, without overwhelming, without like saying it's like we're not giving you the how or the what, like we're, we're learning with you, learning with you as well. So, I mean, first I'd like to say thank you for everyone who just, who shared with us and like and said, you know, this is what's going on and this is what we like and this is what we don't like. <laughs> so that that's helpful, you know, for, for us as well. But um, yeah, I just, I really do hope everyone is doing okay and beyond being a little bit hungry or tired. <laughs> I hope that you're finding joy as well. <laughs> I, I would just echo what Helen's just said in the chat, appreciating everyone's honesty and for sharing their ideas and resources. Uh, and I think, I certainly think from, from my perspective, it's been a fascinating, you know, 50 minutes. And I know that we are, we, you know, we have a series of online events that we as an institute are hosting, and I'm hoping uh, that we can continue these conversations over the coming months with you, David, Helen and Lauren, because I think it's something that we do need to be talking about. And I think, you know, we could we could continue this conversation for another probably half an hour, 40 minutes quite easily. Um, I'm conscious that we have got to the end of our, our time together today. And I'm sure there are some questions that people would like to, you know, continue uh, uh, speaking about. And I'm sure that both David, Helen and Lauren will be more than happy if you wanted to reach out to them via 
LinkedIn, et cetera, to continue the conversations. Guys, I'm sure you'd be more than happy to to continue the conversations offline if, if need be, if people want to reach out to you. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank, well, thank, thank you very much indeed. I can see Lauren is popping her information in LinkedIn there. Thank you, Lauren, for that. That's really appreciated. I'm sure that Helen and David can do that. I'm just going to stop the formal part of the recording now. I just want to say and extend my thanks to uh, 